morning and uh, welcome to the inaugural lecture of the 2019-2020 Conference School Distinguished Lecture Series. My name is Boris Kostana, I am the Associate Dean of the School. And it's now my pleasure to request uh, our colleague Dr. Benson of Mechanical Engineering and also President of MP Dallas to introduce our speaker today. Thanks. Well, uh, thanks everybody thanks for being here. Um, this is a real treat for me because uh, as distinguished lecturers go, this is a very distinguished lecture. And uh, I had the good fortune of working with Professor Larry Tabor from 1982 to 1995. That's when, 82 is when he showed up, 95 is when I left. Uh, um, this is at the University of Rochester. So I'm sure you read the bio, so the, there's some of the, the usual stuff that you can see there. So uh, a Georgia Tech undergrad, Stanford PhD, studied with Chuck Steele, some of you may recognize that name. Uh, did a PhD thesis on the mechanics of the cochlea, which I was reminded of uh, last night, and then uh, spent four years um, uh, doing research for General Motors. And so it was in uh, 82 uh, when the University of Rochester was looking to build its mechanics group, and I chaired that, that search. I was still an untenured assistant professor in hindsight. I'm still kind of blown away by the idea that they would entrust some young guy to, to do that, but um, boy, it turned out really well. Uh, so we hired uh, now Professor Larry Tabor, who came to the University of Rochester in 82. So at the time, he was doing research on these uh, thick shells, or moderately thick shells, with moderately large deformation and the like. And I'm going to come back to that in just a minute. Uh, his research then took a turn into morphogenesis. So again, I think you know about morphogenesis. It's how uh, living structures, organs will change. Uh, due to mechanical stresses, and sometimes that's a bad thing, like in a large heart because your blood pressure is too high, or the development of an actual heart, you know, in a fetus, which starts out as nothing more than a tube. And so Professor Tabor and his colleagues are, are experts in this, in this area. In 97, he moved to Washington University in St. Louis, where he's been uh, ever since. Uh, and he's turned out some, some fantastic PhD uh, graduates, including our own Victor Barner, who's uh, now on our faculty. Um, he's also received a great many awards. I'll just uh, call out one. So in uh, the ASM Division of Bioengineering, there's the Richard Stalak Award for the best paper uh, of the year. And uh, only one person's won it three times, and it's in our car guest. So I, I now want to tell a little story, which I, I told at dinner last night. So for those of you who are just bear with me. Uh, but I'm going to tell you that I've told this story more times than I can count, and I've done it as advice to young professionals. Um, and it's, it involves my, my good friend. So in 82, 83, 84, you know, <coughs> that zone, uh, Professor Tabor was making a name for himself as being very good at nonlinear mechanics. And so things like moderately large deformations of moderately thick shells, that kind of thing. He had NSF funding, he was doing well, he was publishing funding of all the things that you want to see. And then he did something really, and I, the only word I can use for it is courageous. So, Still very young, he decided to make a very significant change in his research field. Um, uh, the University of Rochester actually made available something of, of, of like an internal sabbatical, and he took advantage of it. And it was competitive, you had, you had to apply to get in. So what he did is, he, in essence, he stepped away from the research forefront in order to learn something about anatomy. And he worked with the Department of Pediatrics uh, uh, at the University of, Ro uh, of, of Rochester. And he learned a lot about anatomy and medicine and the like, and of course he brought his own considerable expertise in, in mechanics to this medical field. And I will tell you that the models for the heart back then were laughably simple. Uh, probably uniform thickness, a little more than a balloon. And uh, I'm sure you can appreciate that you can't really do anything predictive in such a simple model. So he brought that considerable expertise uh, to the mechanics of the heart. Now, I, when I talk to other audiences, they're not nearly so knowledgeable as you, so uh, bear with me if this seems a little simplistic, but I do, do like to point out that the heart is an int interesting structure because it's alive. And it goes, you know, love, dub, love, dub, you know, that kind of thing. So it has you know, different states and the like. And, and if, you, if that wasn't hard enough, what Professor Tabor has done is study the development of the heart, uh, you know, over time. So in addition to, you know, beating and, and its normal function, the actual development of that structure. And he's since taken it into other areas, uh, uh, like the development of the brain, uh, eyeballs and the like, and I think we're going to get a little bit of that. So uh, with that, I'm just absolutely thrilled that uh, my good friend is coming here to give this speech.
Can you hear me? Um, so I want to thank Shalini with some twisting of arms by Dick Benson for inviting me here. <laughs> I, this is the first time I've ever, ever landed in a Dallas airport and I actually got off the plane and got out of the airport. So, so it's nice to see the, the town. Um, so um, I can't tell you a lot about, about Dick from the old days, but there's one thing I can tell you. I mean, you probably already know. He's a gigantic Mets fan. And in the 1980s, he used to give me so much grief because I was always a Cardinal, a St. Louis Cardinals fan. And they had such a rivalry in the 1980s. They were both really good, and they were killing each other. 1986 was, was torture for me. They, they was the best Mets. The Mets went on. They won the World Series against Boston. Some fluke error let them in. And, 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 but then the next season, the first game of the year, the Cardinals and the Mets played. This was 1987. And the, and, and the Mets killed the Cardinals the first game. I came into my office the next morning, and I saw flashing all over my, my office door, Mets, clobber Cardinals, just big headlines uh, from the, cut out from the news. That was his doing. <laughs> anyway, okay, so oh, what happened to my... I think it just got loose. Okay, we're fine. We're fine. Um, so uh, ju just notice that we now admit four-legged students. <laughs> so um, one of the great mysteries of biology is how the one-dimensional genetic code is translated into three-dimensional form. You probably recognize this guy. It's a naked bolt rat, one of the, the cutest animal in any zoo. So in the embryo, the genes are like management. They have, this, they have the plans, they supply the materials, and they issue instructions. But it's really the cells and proteins that do the heavy-duty lifting of constructing an embryo. And this is where we work, with the nuts and bolts of development. So mathematical modeling plays a major role in, in, in pretty much everything that we do. And, and we agree completely with the statistician George Box, who said that all models are wrong, but some are useful. This is particularly true when it comes to modeling morphogenesis, which is the creation of biological form, because for a couple of reasons, is that, or that multiple mechanisms can produce the same shape. We're interested in shape, and, and it's hard to determine exactly what mechanism is producing that shape. And there also, as anybody who works in biology knows, there's a very large number of unknown parameters. So to attack this, this problem, uh, we, the strategy, our main strategy, is to first minimize the number of free parameters, then determine Un, whatever re, unknown parameters remain, using experimental data for normal development, and then finally test the model using data for perturbed development. But all this is complicated further by evolution, because embryos have been able to develop ways to compensate for, they have backup mechanisms that compensate for any perturbation. So, it's, so if you do a perturbation you don't, and it does something, you don't know exactly what's going on. or may not do something. Maybe your perturbation is doing something, but something else is coming in and taking over. So our long-term goal is to understand how the embryo creates organs as an aid to researchers trying to develop ways to pre prevent and correct congenital malformations. We don't do any of this correction ourselves. We leave it to the bosses. So I'm going to talk about two problems today, the heart and the eye. Uh, beginning with the heart first, and then we'll do the eye later. So during development, the heart transforms from a single straight tube into a four-chambered pump. The first stage of this process is called looping. As a straight tube deforms into a curved tube, that brings the two, the two atria in purple, the future atria, above the two future ventricles. And then septation divides the, 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 the uh, tube into four chambers. So here I'm going to talk about how the heart tube forms in the first place and then how it loops. In humans, looping begins or takes place during the fourth week of development just after the heart begins to beat. So you might not know this, but your heart Start, the heartbeat in humans starts at about three weeks. And, um, and then um, I'm going to talk about, uh, uh, after that, the looping process. Oh, I already said that I was going to talk about the looping process. Oh, I, here's what I forgot to say. I'm old. Um, so in chickens, uh, looping takes place during the second to third day of a 21-day incubation period. And the, believe it or not, the heart of the chicken embryo uh, develops almost exactly the same as human. So this is a chick embryo after 24 hours of incubation. There's not yet a heart. There, there are membranes that are on either side of the embryo that are, that are folding. So this, this is the folding that you see. And they're gonna, they, they come together at the midline. They fuse and form a heart tube. 
So this is a 24-hour time lapse. And here's the heart tube forming. And then it loops off to the right side of the embryo. And then a day later, the heart is beating, beating forcefully enough to pump blood to the rapidly growing embryo. And for um, what we're going to talk about later is the eye, which is this dark spot right here in the head. Now, all this process gets started with, with the creation of something called the head fold. I'm not going to talk at all about head fold formation uh, because we have the foremost expert on head fold formation in this room, Victor Varner, sitting over here. If you want to, you can ask him. And so this is Victor um, about 10 years ago, I think, when he was a member of our team. Turns out that last night he mentioned this picture, and I had to keep my mouth shut because I knew that this was in here. So the heart forms from a membrane called the splenoplura that's originally flat and consists of two layers uh, make it, made up of mesodermal cells and endodermal cells. The heart fields, the primitive heart fields, are located in these red regions on either side of the mesoderm, uh, either side of the, the midline within the mesoderm. And if you look at it from a top view, this is what the two heart fields look like. Okay. Now, for many years, uh, it was it was thought that these that the, the, this membrane folds on, on either side directly toward the midline, where they fuse and split, with the mesoderm creating the heart tube in red and the endoderm creating the foregut in, in blue. And uh, so this idea stood until roughly 15 years ago when Margaret Kirby and colleagues found that the heart fields actually fold diagonally toward the midline to create the heart tube which was totally different. So instead of, instead of them folding, instead of them, the fold being like this, the fold is like this. OK? And so our objective of this part of the study was to try to determine the mechanics of this folding. What causes this, 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 this type of folding? Oh, and since the uh, uh, endoderm is connected to the mesoderm, then the foregut, which is created at the same time as the heart tube, must be created by the same kind of folding pattern. OK, so two of the main uh, processes that embryos use to, to generate force are growth and contraction. So to first uh, explore the effects of growth on this process, uh, we inhibited cell division using the drug acetylcholine. So up, up on the top, there's a control. This is a control embryo that's cultured from stage 5 when there's no folding yet, nothing here yet, up until stage 12 when we have a looped heart. Um, the folding is indicated by this darkened region up here that elongates to form the heart. And at the same time, this, uh, the bottom of the splen this is the splenoplore that's folding. The bottom of this, of this splenoplore is, called the, is the anterior intestinal portal, which is the opening to the foregut. And it looks like this. Okay, now in this experiment, we expose the embryo to phytocholin to, to knock out uh, mitosis. Um, and you can see that very little is happening. Then we wash the drug out, continued culture, and the folding occurs relatively normally, ending up with a heart tube, even though it has an abnormal shape. So this experiment indicates that the initial folding requires cell prol proliferation. Next to uh, study contraction, we block contraction using the uh, drug blibostatin. So this embryo is exposed to the, exposed to the drug, uh, beginning, again, when there's nothing going on, uh, exposed to it for uh, seven and a half hours, then the drug is washed out, incubation continued for another seven and a half hours. So you can see that when you block contraction, the normal folding occurs. So it doesn't look like much is happening. But what is happening is that the, this, the elongation of the heart tube and the foregut is, is affected. And so we measured the length of the, of this, of the, mem the splenoplore floor from the top of the head down to the bottom of the membrane, plotted as a function of time. The blue is the control curve. And the first seven and a half hours of the red curve is the embryo exposed to blebostatin. As you can see, the elongation slows to nearly a stop. And then after washout, after you wash the drug out, then the elongation rate picks up again and it becomes relatively normal. So this experiment suggests that the elongation of the foregut and the heart tube, they both elongate together, requires contraction just driven by actin and myosin. OK, so from this, we proposed a new hypothesis to ex try to explain what's going on. Um, first, it's important to realize that if you have a membrane composed of two layers, 
and, and the top layer grows in, in horizontally in this case, it will force the membrane to bend with the growing layer along the outer curvature. And so we postulated that to get diagonal uh, bending like this, diagonal folding, we would have to have growth in both the x and y directions. And so we speculated that both uh, layers grow in, these, in the both directions, um, with the bottom layer, the mesoderm, growing at a faster rate than the, than the other layer, causing it to flip over and become on top. And then after the membranes fuse, uh, we, we, we speculate that contraction along the, the lower border of the splenoplura, where the AIP is, uh, generates a tension that pulls these membranes downward, causing them to elongate. Okay, so to test this idea, the plausibility of this idea, you can't really test it specifically, but the, you can test its plausibility mechanically, uh, we created a finite ele element model for the splenoplura, which was a flat plate composed of two layers representing the endoderm and the mesoderm. Uh, we modeled half because of symmetry relative to the, the embryonic midline, which is the y-axis, we only need to model half of the embryo. If we look face on at these two, these two layers, the, this, the uh, heart fields are located in this upper right-hand corner of the mesoderm. The, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, edge of the future anterior intestinal portal is this green stripe down the mesoderm. Um, we put the, uh, the midline on rollers to allow it to slide, this edge to slide up and down. The bottom edge is allowed to slide side to side. The two other edges are free. Oh, and, we, and, we spe and to simulate growth and contraction, we did it the same way. I'm not, gonna, I'm not showing any equations. That's probably the only talk I've ever given that I've never shown any equations at all. But, but to simulate growth and contraction, uh, we did it like we were going to simulate uh, uh, expansion and shortening or, cooling or contraction of a metal that's heated or cooled. So it's like thermal uh, elasticity. Okay, so here's a, a movie of the model. So it starts out as a flat plate. I don't know why it skips to the end. Okay, so here's the diagonal folding. It fuses, we simulate fusion when it hits the midline. Turn on contraction along the green stripe, it pulls everything down. And then we put, we put inflation pressure between the two layers that causes the heart tube, which is in red, to, to expand. This is a cross-sectional view of the model. So there's the folding, comes to the midline slowly. It fuses with the other side, then the layers split. And this is the foregut. This is the foregut here, and this is the heart tube. And it hits what's left of the splenoplura, floor, the part that has it uh, fused. Okay, so now we, we look at what the model predicts, the final model geometry, compare that against the, the, the heart tube geometry when it's, when, after it's formed. Um, Notice that it has, the overall model has the same tapered shape as the heart tube, and these two veins are ophthalmocentric veins, which, which are this part of the splenoplural pleura that have not yet fused. That's represented by this and this. It's, it's not exact, but it's reasonable, I hope. Um, and you see the characteristic arch shape of the anterior intestinal portal. These are cross-sections of, cross of a chick embryo at the locations indicated by these lines up here. The heart tube is the the dark stained region here in each cross section. Compare that against the red of the given by the model in each section. You see that the shape is pretty good in each case. The overall shape of the foregut, which is this little piece here, it has the same, it has the right shape, but it's not flat as much. So it doesn't get everything, but it gets enough that, it, that, the, that he was able to get his PhD out of this. Okay. Um, so now I want to turn, after that, now we have a heart tube, and now I want to, now we, next, turn to the looping problem. Now here I'm going to talk about just the first phase of looping called C-looping, when the straight heart tube deforms into a C-shaped tube that's almost always directed with outer curvature to, toward the right side of the embryo. Now in this experiment, we put labels along the ventral midline of the heart tube, and toward the end of C-looping, notice how they move over to the outer curvature. This indicates that, here's my heart. So instead of, the heart doesn't just bend like this. It, wrote, it, it bends outward and rotates sideways, so the labels move to the outer curvature. So, so you have a co combination of a bending and a rotation or torsion, because the, top, the tops and bottoms don't really, don't really uh, uh, rotate. So you have a, it's really tw twisting. Okay? And so we actually, it it's helpful to consider these two deformations modes separately. 
Now the heart, well, so we have a combination of ventral bending and rightward torsion. Um, the heart tube at this time has a wall that consists of three layers, has a, 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 a thin myocardium, that's the heart, developing heart muscle on the outside, a thick layer of extracellular matrix called cardiac jelly in the middle, and then a, a one cell thick endothelium that lines the lumen of the heart tube where the blood is. Now, so first I'm going to talk about bending. During the last 100 years or so, several hypotheses for, or have been proposed for what causes the heart tube to bend. These, these include constrained growth, where the heart tube just simply outgrows its allotted space and is forced to buckle. Differential growth by cell division or hyperplasia, where the cells along the outer curvature grow faster than those along the inner curvature. Um, active changes in cell shape. It's observed that the cells along the outer curvature become longer in the longitudinal direction, while those along the inner curvature become shorter. If this is an active process, it would force the heart tube to bend like, to bend like this. Manasek, uh, who was a dentist, proposed, but he was a very good dentist, he proposed that, uh, that the cardiac jelly inside the heart tube, uh, it, he, 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 he showed that, infl that it swells and inflates the heart tube, and he proposed that as it inflates the heart tube, the heart tube is still connected on the dorsal side to the foregut, and that puts a constraint on the, on the inflation and causes the heart tube to bend. And it's like, this is, a, this is a balloon from one of his papers that he blew up with a piece of tape along, along one side, and so it shows that it bends with a piece of tape along the inner curvature. And the finally, differential contraction, where the cells on the inner curvature may contract and cause it to bend this way. But over the years, one by one, Pretty much all of these um, possibilities have been ruled out by experiments with the, with the exception of active changes in cell shape. And for many years, we thought that this, is, this was the answer to the problem. We thought we had evidence proving that this was the answer until this paper um, in, published in 2006 by Stufan et al., who found that the heart cells in the myocardium actually increase in size during looping, but the cells along the outer curvature becoming two to three times larger than those along the inner curvature. This came as something of a surprise, because prior to this paper, it was commonly thought that the heart grows exclusively by cell division before birth and by cell enlargement or hypertrophy after birth. And so this is a case where you have hypertrophy before birth, way before birth. And so it led us to reconsider the possibility of differential growth causes the heart tube to bend. So uh, we began by studying bending in, in, of isolated heart tubes which bend in culture without the compl complicating effects of torsion. And so to check the plausibility of, of the differential growth hypothesis, we created a simple finite element, element model for the, heart, for the straight heart tube consisting of a thin cylindrical shell of myocardium or muscle surrounding an inner core of cardiac jelly. First, we specify isotropic growth of the jelly to simulate its swelling that puts the myocardium into a state of compression of tension, and then we simulated growth in the myocardium um, according to the measurements of Sufan et al., and as you can see, it causes a, it causes a bending similar to what we see in the, in the experiments. With the uh, dorsal, original dorsal side located along the inner curvature, this always happens um, in, 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 in vivo or in experiments. You always get that kind of bending. Further test of the model. You always have to do more testing than just shape because, as I said, different mechanisms, various mechanisms can create the same shape. So we have to do further testing. So uh, first we compared experimental and model stresses and strains. Uh, to measure strains, we tracked the motions of labels that were placed on the myocardium as, as the heart tube bent. To characterize stress, we cut the myocardium and, and then and, and measure the aspect ratio of the opening after the cut. This would, so in this case, we cut, we cut, we put a little uh, uh, circumferential cut in the myocardium. It opened longitudinally, and it's, that's because of the tension in the, in, in the longitudinal direction. So, so the, the amount it opens is character, characterizes the tension in the, in the longitudinal direction in this case. This is a comparison between model and experimental results. These are strains are, at, are actually stretch ratios in the radial circumferential longitudinal directions along the inner curvature and outer curvature. So you can see in these, in these uh, strains, um, in these directions, the agreement between the model and experiment is very good. 
but the model under predicts the uh, magnitude of the radial strain, which is a measure of how much the myocardium thickens as it bends. These are at comparison of aspect ratios um, between model and experiment. So these are aspect ratios uh, due to cutting uh, that characterize stress, uh, stress in, the, in the longitudinal circumferential directions at both the outer curvature and inner curvature. At the outer curvature, you see the agreement between model and experiment is, is, very, is very nice. Uh, again, the, the, at the inner curvature, the model underpredicts the change in uh, stress. But, the, but the, the, big, the most important thing here is that during bending, this is a decrease in aspect ratio, meaning that the stress, the tension, actually decreases in both directions at all locations in the heart tube as it bends. And the model does predict the right trends. And so the agreement in trends seems to support the differential growth hypothesis. Okay, now as far as torsion goes. So we found that bending is driven by uh, forces that, that are generated intrinsic to the heart tube, but torsion is driven mainly by forces extrinsic, outside, external forces on the heart. Some of these forces are applied by the two ophthalmocentric veins, which grow and push against the bottom end of the heart tube. If we look at a cross-section of a chick embryo, um, here's the heart tube connected by the, the, the dorsal mesocardium to the foregut at this time. And on the other side, the splenoma pleura, which I mentioned before, is under tension and presses against the ventral surface of the heart tube. So we did some experiments to try to understand what's going on here. Um, so in this experiment, we, we put labels along both the left and right edges of the heart tube, cultured the heart or the embryo for six hours, the labels along the left side become these green labels that move to the, to the uh, uh, outer surface of the heart tube, uh, move to, the, to the ventral surface of the heart tube, the one that on the front. And these labels on this side actually become these red labels that are actually move behind the heart tube. So as the heart twists this way, the labels, the whole thing rotates like this. And it's indicated by the motion of the labels. Um, and then, in this, then after this, we cut off both, we cut off the splenoma pleura first, the, the membrane over the heart tube, and both, of the, both sets of labels move back toward the two edges, and then we remove the two veins, cut off the two veins, and they return to the left and right edges. So this simple experiment indicates that the splenoma pleura and these two ophthalmocentric veins drive this torsion. So from, from this experiment, we postulated this hypothesis for torsion. Um, this is a schematic of a ventral view of the heart tube and veins, uh, and this is a cross-sectional view, and this shows the, uh, the pressure that, that the uh, splenoma pleura here presses it as it presses against the heart tube. So we, we speculate that the two veins grow, which we, we can see prove that they grow, with the left vein growing, the left vein becomes a little bit larger, so it grows a little bit more, pushes with a little bit more force than the right vein, gives the heart a little bit of a jog toward his right side, and then the splenoma pleura pushes the heart tube backward the rest of the way, and it causes it to rotate about its attachment to the foregut. So what this hypothesis would predict is that if you could reduce the force in the left vein below that in the right vein, we should be able to, we should see a leftward looping instead of rightward. And so in this experiment, um, and when I say we, I always mean somebody else. It always means a postdoc or, or a student. Um, so that's just, everybody knows that. Anyway, so we remove the part by dissection of the left vein to try to reduce the force in that vein. And in a significant number of embryos, we got leftward looping. And in, in normal embryos, human embryos too, they almost always loop to the right side. More than 99% of the time, they loop to the right side. So in this case, we got something like 30% that went the wrong way, so it was highly significant. Okay, now putting all this together, we created a three-dimensional finite element model for the heart tube and the two veins with the initial geometry reconstructed from cross-sectional images of, of the straight heart tube in the chick embryo. Um, we put this, this model between two membranes to represent the splenoma pleura in front and the foregut behind. If we look at a side view of the, of the model, um, the top and bottom parts of the, of, of the heart tube are connected to the foregut through rollers. A lot, of, a lot of them slide up and down. The backside between 
these two rollers uh, is free because this, this torsal mesocardium ruptures as the heart loops. This is a cross section of, of the model showing that it, it contains myocardium, cardiac jelly, a lumen, and, and this looks a lot like what we have here. This is longitudinal suction showing the distribution of the jelly. So here's our model. Um, so we, again, we specified growth according to the measurements of SUFON at all in, in the heart tube. We specified growth in, on the top parts of both veins with this vein growing a little bit faster than this one. Um, and we specified contraction along the bottom parts of the vein the veins, because the splenal, what's left of the splenal pleura, it's over the heart, and it comes and wraps around the bottom parts of the, vein, and the veins, as I showed before, they're under, they, they contract, and they're under tension. So when I turn this on, begin slowly, oh, and watch these labels, these are to, so you can visualize rotation. So note how the labels move over toward the outer curvature, and similar position as it is in the real heart, chick heart. Um, notice the shape of the left vein has a bump here and it has this bump here. So overall, and you know, this overall physical shape looks not bad. Okay, further testing, again, we measured strains. And in, in, in this case, uh, we measured average strains in seven, di seven different regions of the heart tube and veins and compared model and experimental results experiments are the open symbols, the models are the closed, symbol, closed symbols, all plotted as a function of time. These are longitudinal strains. And so you can see that in each region, the general trends, except for possibly down here, are not bad at all. To test the predictive ability of this model, we did uh, perturbations, mechanical perturbations. So in this, in, in this experiment, you put labels along both the left and right edges of the heart tube, cultured uh, to the end of C looping. And as I showed before, the labels move as it rotates. And the same thing happened when we put these labels on the model, the same thing happens. They move to similar locations. Uh, next, we remove the splenal pleura. As I showed before, the labels move back toward the left and right edges. Same thing happens in the model. And in this experiment, then we cut off the top, we, the top part of the uh, 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 embryo we, got, we separated it from the, I mean, we separate the heart from the embryo on the top, heart tube tilted, same thing happened in the model. So those are acute experiments. All those, those, those uh, responses all happen within a matter of minutes. This is the, acute, the, the chronic response. This happens over a period of hours. Um, so we put labels along the, the midline. This, this postdoc actually was not as good a labeler as the other the one who did the other ones. But anyway, they're still there. Um, so we put labels along the midline, then uh, cut off either the left vein, the right vein, the right vein, or both veins, and culture the heart for 12 hours. And we simulated these experiments. It's important to, to note that all the parameters in these models are, have not been changed. The only thing we did was cut off the left vein, the right vein, or both veins, and ran the model and compared uh, uh, the shapes. So you can see that if we cut off the Left vein, we get left, left looping with the labels over here. Same thing happened in the experiments. If we cut off the uh, uh, right vein, the heart loops to the right, even though it has a normal, a little bit of normal shape, some, kind of similar to what we saw experimentally. And if we cut off both veins, the, um, it, here, the heart loops to the right. And it was a little bit surprising to me, but it also looped to the right in the experiments. OK, so I'm done with the heart now. Let's see. Um, so I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking about the eye. So like the heart, the brain begins as a, as a simple tube, shown here outlined in red. Uh, the eyes, the primitive eyes, grow outwards, a pair of vesicles, they grow outward from the forebrain, uh, both sides of the forebrain, and they come in contact with this green membrane called surface ectoderm. Shown here in close-up, after they come in contact, both layers flatten and thicken and then bend inward or invaginate with the optic vesicle in yellow forming what's called the optic cup. Later on, it becomes the, the retina. And the ectoderm rolls up into a completely fluid-filled lens vesicle, primitive lens. This is what they look like in the chick embryo, the lens vesicle, optic cup. And later on, the lens focuses the light onto this. The retina becomes a very thin membrane in the back. 
So uh, the first question that we wanted to investigate, what causes the optic vesicle to invaginate? Um, the obvious choice would be contraction, because many invaginations that occur in the embryo are driven by contraction along one side, the apical side of, this, of the cell sheet, or epithelium. And that causes the, the membrane to bend with the contractile fibers located along the inner curvature. So we stained embryos for, to, to look for, to see what's going on. We stained them for actin, because it takes actin and myosin for this kind of contraction. Um, and what we found was, is that the lens vesicle had actin located along the inner curvature, where it should be, but, the, but along the optic vesicle, it was on the outer curvature, where, which doesn't help at all to cause it to bend. So actin is located on the right side to drive lens invagination, and that turns out that's really what happens, but it's on the wrong side for the optic cup. So it rules out contraction for this. So that led some researchers to speculate that the lens, as it invaginates, it just simply pushes the optic cup inward. But experiments by uh, Heyer et al. Uh, conflicted with this hypothesis. And we repeated their experiments to take a closer look. So in these experiments, we cultured the embryo to a certain stage of development and then removed the surface ectoderm. If it was removed before uh, the invagination had occurred, and then it was cultured after it was cultured overnight, there's still no invagination. Nothing's happened. But if we removed it after the invagination has already started and cultured it overnight, the next day we found a pretty a relatively normal looking optic cup, even though there's no lens. So there's no lens to push it inward. And so this would suggest that lens invagination is not needed for optic cup formation, and that the surface ectoderm is needed up until a certain time. When the, uh, when the invagination of the cup uh, begins. Okay, so this led higher at all to speculate that the surface ectoderm is needed until a certain time point in development to send signal, a signal to the optic vesicle telling it to invaginate, but they had no supporting evidence, so we looked for another alternative mechanism. So first it's important to realize that when, the, when these two, when the optic vesicle contacts the surface ectoderm, they stick together by this matrix that's secreted by both layers, but mainly by the ectoderm. And so we speculated that what's going on here is that, so if you have, if you have a, 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 this is a section, say, of, of, of a straight, let's just say a straight membrane, and you have a stiff uh, matrix that's not growing on this side, but these cells are dividing and trying to elongate, they would, it would try, they'd try to expand, and this would, would inhibit expansion, cause it to bend with the, with the matrix along the inner curvature, similar to what you have when you have a balloon with a tape on, piece of tape on one side. Um, and that's what happens. The optic cup has this matrix along the inner curvature. And so to explain those experimental results, we, we, we speculated that if the surface ectoderm is removed too early, then there's not enough matrix that is formed to cause invagination. But if, if it's removed later, then there's enough matrix present to cause invagination even though the surface ectoderm has already is, has been taken off. To test the feasibility of this idea, we uh, uh, modeled the optic vesicle as a, a thick spherical shell, coming back to my shell stuff, the thick spherical shell with two main regions. The inner region, this is gonna invaginate this region, and this region is, is the outside the invaginating region. They're both cells, cell layers. They both grow in both the circumferential, equal growth in the circumferential and the meridional directions, with the inner layer growing faster than the outer layer, uh, or the outer re inner region growing faster than the outer region. And the matrix is represented by a relatively stiff, thin layer on the, on the outside of the inner region. So we turn on the growth. Oh, and, and we actually measured, estimated the properties of these, these cells in, in the matrix by a microindentation. When we turn this on, now I don't know why this is so nervous. But it only does that on this computer. But you can see how it invaginates. I think it'll, when it slows down there. You see it has a really nice invagination that looks a lot like a real optic cup. But again, we gotta do more than compare shapes. So additionally, we measured, um, the uh, invagination depth as a function of time, the, uh, the thickness and the curvature at the center of the optic vesicle as a function of time here and here, compared experimental data to the 
model data, model uh, results given by the blue lines, and you can see that in each case, the agreement is not bad. To test the model predictions, uh, we did additional experiments where we removed this ectoderm. So, so again, if we move it at the, at the early stage of invagination, what happens is immediately after we remove it, the, some of the curvature is lost, but not entirely, uh, because there's still, there's still matrix left. Okay, and this is just within a few minutes. Uh, but then to degrade, degrade the rest of the matrix, we expose the embryo to collagenase, and the, the vesicle pop back out completely. The, the, the inward curvature reversed to outward curvature. But if we removed it at a later stage of invagination, it remained invaginated. And in general, we found is that the number of, of, of vesicles that pop back out, or cups that pop back out, decrease with the age of the embryo when we did these perturbations. So the matrix seems to be needed to maintain the optic vesicle invaginations or the early but not the later stages. So we simulate these experiments with our model. We ran the model to an early stage of invagination here and simulate the removal of the matrix by taking the, making the properties of the matrix, the stiffness of the matrix, equal to those of the cells below it and we had the matrix grow until the growth was equal to that of the cell, so it's effectively gone. And when we did that, you see it popped back out. But if we repeated this at a later stage of invagination, it remained invaginated, because it's grown in this, during this time, and it now can't, can't fit back through the hole that it created. It has too much material to fit back through the hole, so it stays invaginated. Okay, more recently, uh, we extended our axisymmetric model to more realistic geometry, so this shows um, a side view of the initial configuration. Here's the optic vesicle. This is surface ectoderm. So now, when this grows, when the, when the optic vesicle grows and contacts the surface ectoderm, because of the asymmetry, it will cause this vesicle to bend downward. And you can see that happening here. But if I roll the, run the movie, so there's the bending. And then it starts to invaginate here. And uh, if we flip it around and compare it to a sketch of an actual optic cup, you see it has a very similar shape, including the formation of this groove here on the bottom called the optic fissure, which later on be becomes a conduit for blood vessels. Okay, now I'm going to spend just a few minutes talking about the lens. It's just to take a few minutes. Um, I'm not going to talk about how it, how it invaginates, because I already said that it invaginates because of contraction along this apical surface. But one question that has been largely overlooked until now is how does this vesicle close? Everybody knows it invaginates, and people have said, well, you know, it's just going to invaginate enough and it finally will close. But the problem is not as simple as you may think. If, you, if the, the, if the uh, lens has the shape of a cylinder, then if you have it contract in, this, in a thin region on the, on the inside curvature, it will close really easily. It's like if you were taking a piece of paper and rolling it up you can make it close, no problem. But the lens is not a cylinder. It's more like a spherical shape with a hole in it that needs to close. And if you look at it from a top view, what, happen, what you have to have is that the circumference of the opening has to become zero as it closes. This creates huge circumferential stresses out, surrounding this hole that, pre, that inhibit this closure. And so you have to have a way to overcome these, these extra stresses that, that inhibit the closure, um, that resist the closure. And this is also similar to the problem you have if you, if you, have a, if you wound, uh, if, you, if you have a circular wound, it has to close. And embryos have developed very nice, very nice way to develop enough force to overcome these stresses. And what happens is if you, wound, if you put a, punch a circular hole in an embryo, Victor has some, done some of this hole punching, and some of his wounds have healed. So what happens is that within seconds, it's unbelievable, within seconds, an, a contractile ring starts to form around the edge of the wound, and it contracts and closes the wound within minutes and without leaving a scar. Very interesting problem in itself. So, so um, anyway, so we looked for a, a ring like this by staining actin in our embryos. Couldn't find it. We couldn't find any obvious ring surrounding the opening in the, in the lens. Uh, that would cause it to close. So, uh, as a possible alternative, we looked we, we looked at this pro at this possibility. 
So for decades, it was known that a ring, during lens closure, there's a ring of dead, dying cells or dead cells that appears. Uh, it's called apoptosis, programmed cell death. It appears around the opening to the lens as it, as it closes. And we thought, well, maybe these cells are dying and, and being removed to shrink the circumference, like the contractile ring would. And so we exposed some embryos to um, apoptotic inhibitors, and we found that most of the lenses would, did not close. To test the feasibility, again, we turned to modeling. And this is the surface ectoderm. Before it has started to invaginate, it has a, 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 contractile, a, surface, a, a contractile layer on its surface. Um, when we make it contract, it invaginates. That's no surprise, but only to a certain point. This is about as far as it will go before it stops. And then uh, we simulate apoptosis within this region, originally here, this region here, um, in a circumferential direction, and that made it close completely. And here's a 3D uh, representation of the full model after, after, it's, after it closes. And this is uh, the shape of a cross-sectional, there's a cross-sectional shape of a lens in the chick embryo after it closes. And if you compare, so we modeled again half of it, if you compare this against this, Again, it doesn't look too bad. And then finally, we, we did more geometric measurements. So let's see, we measured the, uh, uh, the thickness at the center, the uh, uh, arc length along the out, inner, outer curvature and inner curvature, here and here. Uh, this is the outer curvature and inner curvature. And we measured the uh, uh, gap distance, the normalized gap distance here as a function of time. And again, in each case, you compare the model experimental results, and you see pretty good agreement, especially here. I was really impressed by this and this. So in conclusion, our models are obviously wrong, but we hope that they're useful. And thank you. There, no, there's some pressure inside, but it's so it's so small that uh, it just doesn't seem to have much effect. On, but it does cause it does affect the, the, the growth of the of the eye um, of the optic vesicle. It'll affect the growth of the optic vesicle, but, but it doesn't seem to affect the invagination. So so if you, if you take the pressure out, it will it will grow. It will be smaller, just like the brain is smaller, if you take the pressure out. So as a, as a follow-up to that, right, there are groups, right, where they've taken, you know, aggregates of, right, stem cells that will undergo, right, or recapitulate right, certain aspects of optic hypogenesis. Do you, you know, do you speculate that, you know, those sort of self-assembly processes in culture are, are you know, invaginating by a similar mechanism where they're getting ECM that's being deposited? Well, that's still debatable. It's a Japanese group that used this unbelievable paper. So they mixed some, cell, some stem cells together, gave them some stuff, some chemicals that, that they see in, in embryos. And they, just the cells formed an optic vesicle and then invaginated it to create an optic cup. All, it was nothing else. It's just these cells that did all this. And, uh, but, uh, and then they had a model that, that uh, I couldn't figure out their model completely, but they had a model that seemed to that support, they had a different mechanism. And so two possibilities, either that the, the, the cells in culture do it, they find a different mechanism uh, to, to create it, or, we're, or one of the two are, is wrong, or that both are right, that you have multiple mechanisms to, to create the same shape. Like I said, you always have backup mechanisms, and maybe they found another mechanism. Don't know. Well, you want it normally. You want it to loop to the right because if it because there's asymmetry, left-right asymmetry, and other things like the aorta, pulmonary arteries, veins, 
Everything has to be on the right side or else you get connections to the wrong places. So you, so you want... Now, some people have complete reversal of everything, and they're, they're perfectly fine. If everything is, goes to the left instead of the right, all the con right connections are there and you're perfectly fine. But that rarely happens. Um, so you see a lot of abnormalities if the heart loops the wrong way and everything else doesn't. Um, but, the, but it's not just the veins that cause it to loop to the right. There are, there are probably four, three or four or five other things that also perturb it toward the right side. The vein is just one. So again, it's, you have these redundant mechanisms or else most of us would probably be dead by now <laughs> if we didn't have all these backups going on. So at a general perspective question, you briefly mentioned the role of mechanical testing to get to the actual viscoelastic properties of the tissues. So I'd be curious uh, to hear how you, how adequate you find the information in the literature uh, to be regarding the mechanical properties of these tissues and where there might be areas for improvement. Well, there's not a whole lot of data in the literature outside of what we've done. Or Victor, Victor has done some of this. Um, and some of the data in the literature, you'll find measurements that have been done by biologists or by this dentist I, I mentioned. And, and you and, so there have been like three or four different groups that have measured the, the, the fluid pressure inside the brain in the embryo. And they cover a range of two to three orders of magnitude. Because some of them we suspect they, they converted units wrong or they, I mean, they were way off. I mean, and, and so we got, we got the, and so we had other ways of testing whether or not our measurements were right because we could measure material properties. And if you put the pressure inside and if it inflates, if it inflates to 100 times what, is, what it really does, you know that those measurements were probably wrong. So there are other ways of knowing. So typically, I don't, I don't trust any single measurement that I find in the literature of anything unless two or three other people have repeated it. Uh, yeah, so in these conclusions, say the, the models are wrong, they may be useful, like, um, I don't, you know, I'm not trying to question, like, the, you know, just, like, quest for pure understanding or knowledge or whatever, but what might be some of the more translational uses of these models that you could imagine? Well, I don't claim that any of the models are useful. <laughs> They're, what I, what, for translation, I mean. Um, what I get out of them is an understanding. I try to use them to understand what's happening, and that's all I try to do. Um, because I, I, I don't believe that, you know, I show these nice predictions, but that just might be pure luck that we happen to find something that seems to work into the certain experiments that we did. But I'm showing you the good stuff. <laughs> I haven't shown you, shown you the bad stuff. And, and, but if it's bad enough, then we, then we, we throw it out and start over. Um, but, but yeah, so I can go into, whole, I can give a whole other lecture on what you can get out of modeling and why you can't believe a model, um, any kind of model, even, even, well, I kind of believe most of what Einstein, most of his models, but, but, but there's a lot of models even out of, outside of biology that, that you have to take with a grain of salt because there's always, even Einstein could be proven wrong someday. You just don't know. And, and actually his models don't work at the molecular level. So you just don't know until somebody proves you wrong. You assume it's right until you're proven wrong. Um, you brought up kind of like uh, uncertainty in model parameters. And what a lot of people do computationally is like sensitivity analysis, right? Where you give these parameters a distribution and then you see in the computational space whether your predictions still happen, right? Um, or, or they're sensitive to it. And so, what leads you to do more, instead of doing that, maybe, do you do that, first of all, and oh, sure. the mechanical part seems to be like the better validation of it, the mechanical perturbation. Can you talk about that at all? Well, so in biology, sensitivity analysis only gives, gets you so far because so many of the parameters, even if, they, if you carefully, measure, if you take two embryos, and you do exactly the same measurements at exactly the same time of development, you might get answers that are 100% different. And, and that's typical, especially in embryos. They're so variable. The shape is even highly variable. And so the heart goes through all these, it, they all have the same tr 
basic shape. You know, it has a loop. It looks like a loop tube, but that tube may be squashed this way a little bit more than the next one. But they all end up looking the same at the, in the final result because it somehow it corrects all these. It makes all these corrections uh, because if some because it can detect if something's going wrong and it makes corrections. So there's only so much that you can get out of uh, get out of uh, sensitivity analysis in biology. You can you can predict uh, whether or not something. You, the parameters that the final shape is too sensitive to a parameter, then you say, oh, it's not believable. But there's so much variability, it's very hard to know what's right and what's wrong. So all you can do is look at the trends, I think. That's what I try to, try to, uh, to, 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 to convince people to, to do, is look at trends, not quantitative comparisons, because there's too much variability in biology to make quantitative comparisons. We can't get to the, you know, 12 decimal point like physics, physicists can. But you know, sometimes the first decimal point is all we can get. And, and, and you know, sometimes one significant figure is the best we can do. We might be, if we're, sometimes we're off by only one order of magnitude. <laughs> that seems good. So, so it, sensitivity analysis only gets you so far in, the, in these problems.